Emma Mijas died a horrible and painful death unnecessarily on her very first Christmas Eve 2004 at the hands of 25 doctors and nurses, another victim of medical malpractice. All 25 doctors and nurses systematically administered the wrong drugs for her life-threatening condition called SLOS. SLOS, smith Lemley Optis Syndrome, is a congenital abnormality which requires treatment strategies on supplying supplemental cholesterol. They gave Emma the wrong drug, Questran, not once, but 92 times, yes, 92 times in one month, a cholesterol-reducing drug, not the cholesterol supplemental drug she needed. All of them knew better. They were trained to know better. They were some of the world's leading authorities at the Louisiana State University Health Science Center in New Orleans. But they just didn't give a damn about Emma's life. In 2013, the prestigious Journal of Patient Safety published a study that as many as 440,000 patients die each year from preventable medical errors. That would make medical errors the third leading cause of death in America, behind heart disease and cancer, which is second. These people are not dying from the illnesses that caused them to seek hospital care in the first place. No, they are dying from mistakes that hospitals could have prevented. What are these fatal errors? Who are these incompetent and negligent doctors? A New England Journal of Medicine January 28, 2016 study reported that 1% of physicians accounted for 32% of paid malpractice claims over the last 10 years. The ugly truth is that little is being done to hold these dangerous doctors accountable. Researchers found that bad doctors showed distinctive characteristics, including having paid previous malpractice claims. So it stands to reason that healthcare providers could eliminate one third of medical malpractice along with patients' pain and suffering, as well as the added cost of corrective surgeries, long-term care and indemnity payments by removing the worst 1% of doctors. Why aren't bad doctors stopped from practicing? The answer lies at least partially in the National Practitioner Data Bank, a clearinghouse for information on medical malpractice that Congress established in 1986 to help state licensing boards police the healthcare industry. The national database was supposed to help states identify dangerous doctors and prevent them from harming more patients, and is used by hospitals, insurers, and licensing boards to track doctors' records check prospective hires and make other decisions. But it is virtually useless in holding doctors accountable because by federal law, none are listed by name. They are assigned a random number to protect their identities. Even if doctors were identified in the data as they should be, the public would still be barred by law from accessing the records. So vulnerable sick patients sit in the waiting rooms of bad physicians without a clue about their poor record of performance. And in many cases, a negligent doctor's insurance company pays the victim of malpractice and the doctor goes back to work. If a doctor develops a bad enough reputation in one town, he can move to a new state and continue practicing. This is unbelievable. But today, the public does not have access to the database to identify doctors' names and addresses to identify doctors with uniquely long histories of being sued or disciplined for medical malpractice. Because on September 1st, 2011, the government cut off public access. What was behind that decision? Apparently, one Kansas doctor with a trail of malpractice suits, Dr. Robert Tenney. The Kansas-based doctor complained to the Government Health Resources and Service Administration that the Kansas City Star newspaper was publishing the story of one of his patients, Mary Beth Chase, who died in 2007 after undergoing a brain surgery with Dr. Tenney. It is also noted that Tenney had been sued at least 16 times for medical malpractice, but had never been disciplined by the state's 
licensing boards. The Insider Exclusive produced a TV story on this case with the lawyers who represented Mary Beth's family when doctors go bad, Mary Beth Chase versus Dr. Robert T. Tenney. Tenney finally settled the Chase family's wrongful death suit for $1 million. The settlement brought total malpractice payments paid on Tenney's behalf since the early 1990s to roughly $3.7 million. In some states, including California, Colorado, Georgia, and New York, patients can go to medical board's websites to find out about doctors' malpractice histories, but not in Kansas and Missouri. Why don't doctors report on bad doctors? Physicians often see the mistakes made by their peers, which puts them in a sticky ethical situation. Should they tell the patient about a mistake made by a different doctor? Too often, they don't. Why not? One reason is that doctors depend on each other for business. So a physician who breaks the code of silence may become known as an informer or snitch and lose referrals, a financial penalty. Doctors also may be wary of becoming entangled in a medical malpractice case or causing a colleague to face legal consequences. The bottom line, too often doctors aren't learning from errors, nor are patients getting the information they need to receive proper treatment or compensation when the outcome is harmful. In this insider exclusive network TV special, Justice in America, Elizabeth and Greg Brubaker's story, we visit with April Strang Coute at her law offices. As we take you inside today's legal system, examining April's strategies and her clients' thoughts, and in vivid detail, showing you the often heartbreaking stories of cases like her client, Elizabeth and Greg Brubaker, who April successfully won a verdict for $6.4 million. These victims could be you or me one day. And if you are so unlucky, you will quickly find that justice in America is a hard-won battle where very few insurance companies, doctors, nurses, and hospitals ever do the right thing. And you need experienced and passionate trial lawyers like April who wage these battles with their own financial resources to get their clients justice. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. my great privilege to introduce April strand -Coute. Welcome to the show, April. Thank you very much, Steve. We're here in wonderful Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and you have a practice where you specialize in medical malpractice, correct? I do. Um, tell our audience why that specialty interests you. Well, Steve, I've been practicing medical negligence on behalf of the plaintiff or the patient for the past 36 years. It's all that I've ever done. I own my own practice, so I'm the only lawyer here, and I really enjoy that opportunity to have the challenge and the responsibility of working on my own. When I started this practice many, many years ago as a young person, I had actually thought to defend the medical profession. I still have a great deal of respect for medicine, but as I evolved into my practice, I came to understand that there were, in fact, legitimate cases that needed to be brought on behalf of the patient. And I came to understand that I would have the privilege and the responsibility to screen those cases and only take cases that really had merit. And because lives could change with appropriate representation and the medical profession could be protected from frivolous suits in the way that I practice, I, I have been very attracted to that. Right. There are, and I'm glad you brought up that word frivolous because there are some people on the other side, on the insurance lobby side, that say all lawyers just file cases in the pursuit of jackpot justice, right? Um, but um, realistically, you know, we're all human beings. Doctors are human beings. They make mistakes. Uh, they should be held accountable when they make mistakes. Oftentimes those mistakes are because of negligence or incompetence, and that's why lawsuits exist. You want to hold the doctor responsible. What we have found in doing these shows many, many years is that 3% of doctors 
cause 30% of the medical malpractice cases. And that's another issue because we have to think, well, why isn't the medical profession policing their own doctors? They would eliminate the problems. What's your answer to that? I think there are many reasons for that code of silence, as it's known. Um, and, and that's why I think it's important that there are physicians out there who become expert witnesses, who should be at the top of their field, who should be unbiased, who should be out there to really reveal the truth um, that's needed. And it can be very difficult to navigate those waters because there, there, I would not say it's a conspiracy, but there certainly is a mindset that the medical profession uh, polices their own and they should be uniquely responsible for that. And that doesn't always happen. And I want to bring up, there's a very uh, influential factor a lot of people don't realize, and that's the insurance companies. Insurance companies provide medical malpractice insurance. They are the ones that, if they lose a case, they have to pay. They are the ones that provide the legal teams, and some of the legal teams are really good, you know, so that um, they don't lose. And it's unfortunate because um, there's this is not an issue of right or wrong. It's an issue of we don't want to lose, right? And I've seen time and time again, and we can get into this later, where a doctor needs um, medical expert, legal medical experts. Sometimes very difficult, you use them in a case, but it's sometimes very difficult to get an expert that lives in the same jurisdiction as the incident that happened because the insurance companies will call up the hospital, for example, where the doctor practices and say to them, do you know that Dr. So-and-so is gonna testify against this other doctor and we insure your hospital and we insure you and we insure him. We don't want this happening. And if everybody remembers the movie, The Verdict, for example, same situation, you know, so um, this is a tough field. We are here today to talk about your clients and your clients are Elizabeth uh, Brubaker and her husband, correct? Yes, it is. Tell our audience a little bit about who Elizabeth is. Elizabeth is a very bright and beautiful young woman. She's now in her mid-30s. She is someone who was misdiagnosed with a serious neurological condition in her mid-20s. And um, she is someone who has no capacity for self-pity. She is bold. She has an enormous optimism and positive spirit. When I took her to a jury trial, she made it very clear to me that I would not be permitted to ask the jury for any compensation for lost wages or her inability to work in the future. And I very easily could have done that. It was very legitimate. But she got on the stand and she looked at the jurors and with all humility, she said to them, I, I am a person with a disability, but I'm not disabled. And it is fully her intention, and, and I tend to believe it's true, that she'll get back into the workforce, although she's paralyzed, and will be a productive member of society. So she, she is remarkable, almost otherworldly. Tell our audience what was the misdiagnosis and what was the result of being misdiagnosed? Elizabeth had what's known as a congenital Chiari malformation. It's a malformation in the brain. Essentially what that is is brain tissue that extends outside the skull and enters into the spinal canal. And when that happens, it causes a disruption of the cerebral spinal fluid flow and that can cause some devastating consequences. Elizabeth was misdiagnosed with this condition. And why that becomes so important is that in a woman of childbearing age, if she has a child and goes through childbirth, the Chiari malformation can worsen precipitously because of the forces of labor on the brain and the brainstem. Uh, Elizabeth, of course, had her first child without any knowledge that she had this condition, so there were no precautions taken. No one knew she had the condition, and that led to her paralysis. What eventually uh, happened with this case? She came to you, and I see this kind of a difficult uh, issue to explain to the jury, right? Um, it took me, having done this work for so many years and really meandered all through different aspects of medicine, it took me a long time to master the understanding of the medicine here. And it was formidable and a little frightening to think that I had to be able to do that with a jury and uh, teach these people in just a few days what was so important. So we do that in my line of work with medical experts. And I was 
extremely fortunate to be able to work with the leading physician in the world on Chiari malformation, complex Chiari malformation, which Elizabeth had. Um, when he came into the courtroom, he won't be named because he wants no notoriety, but he crossed state lines. He studied the case. He would take no money for his appearance at trial, uh, ask me only to give a substantial donation to the Chiari Foundation, win or lose the case. And he showed the brain scans to the jury. He went through anatomical exhibits and models. He taught the jury what this problem really was. And um, certainly without him, it would have been difficult for me to try to do that. Yeah, let me ask you, had she been properly diagnosed before she had her first child, how would her life have been different? It would have been night and day because she would not be paralyzed. And uh, today, being paralyzed, as she mentioned in the jur to the jurors, um, she nothing holds her back. Oh my goodness, yes. I mean, Elizabeth was a very, very active young woman before this malady beset her. So she didn't want to stop. And she engaged in adaptive kayaking, adaptive cycling. She participated in marathons. But it went beyond even her physical capacity to be active. Um, as soon as she recovered from the surgery that was eventually done, she began to run fundraising programs in, here in our local community in Lancaster mm -hmm. for the Chiari Foundation to help bring awareness to this problem and to help other people. She is just a fireball of energy. We have Elizabeth and her husband, Greg, uh, on Zoom right now, and we're gonna bring them on so they can tell a little bit about their experiences. So let's do that right now. Um, the misdiagnosis has made it pretty difficult. Uh, before I was diagnosed, I did have pain and I had spasms, but they were more of an inconvenience. Uh, the spasms now are pretty intense. They can affect my function. Uh, physically, I was capable of doing a lot more uh, before the delivery of my son. Uh, I did not really have many physical limitations. I was a marathon runner. I was in the gym all the time. I worked full time, 40 plus hours a week. I was a very active person. Uh, the proper pronunciation for my diagnosis is Chiari malformation. I was also diagnosed with basilar invagination. Uh, cervical cranial instability, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and a tethered cord. Um, my life now, I am a very typical mom. I have two kids that keep me very busy and active, um, and my physical disability does sometimes make it a little slower and difficult for us to do things, but we always find a way to make it happen. Um, I never really try to let my disability get in the way of anything for my children. Um, they're extremely adaptive and they help me when I need it. If I do need help, we always troubleshoot stuff and come up with ideas and ways that we can make things happen. I decided to get involved with the Chiari and Syringe Manalia Foundation. One of the main reasons I wanted to get involved was I had never met anybody else with the same diagnosis. And I wanted to just talk with other people and see if we had similar stories and could relate. Um, and then I started hosting found fundraisers for Chiari and Syringe Manalia Foundation. And I was able to meet several other local families um, in the state that I lived in. Um, and also outside of the state, some people drove, you know, two or three hours away just to come and meet. Um, and we were able to discuss our stories and we all had very similar stories. Um, I also got very involved with um, adaptive sports, adaptive kayaking and arm cycling. I've done a triathlon um, with two of my girlfriends. We did a team triathlon. Um, and it has just meant a lot to me to be able to get back into some of those things that I once really enjoyed. I loved running and I'm not capable of doing that anymore, but I am capable of arm cycling. And I did my first race and I placed second place overall and first female. And it was something that I was really proud of that I worked very hard to train for. I think one of the things that really surprised me was just how many people locally also had a QRE malformation. Yeah. You know, we had never heard of it before, and you know, it, was, it was just a surprise to us. And they all had very similar stories, especially of being um, blown off by doctors or told that it was not causing any issues, and that's just not the truth. It was really difficult to see uh, Elizabeth being kind of blown off by this doctor. You know, he, he told her that she had conversion disorder and that it was all in her head and there was nothing actually wrong with her. 
um, that it was just new mom stress, uh, and that's you know why she couldn't walk, um, which is kind of ridiculous because you know women have babies every single day, and don't end up not being able to walk. Um, so you know, that was frustrating. Uh, he, he also he did make the diagnosis later of Chiari malformation, but he didn't really tell us anything about it. He wrote it down in a post-it note and told us to Google it. I honestly don't have much to say to Magnish Kumar. I just wish that he would take Chiari malformation patients seriously and just refer us out. We belong with neurosurgery specialists that perform Chiari malformation surgeries and understand the diagnosis. And it is okay to say, I don't know, and I need to send you to somebody that might. It is not a neurology specialty. And I just, the whole thing was just so frustrating. I should have had the option to get another opinion and he denied me of that option. And I just hope he does not make the same mistake to any other patient because it's life altering and it's not fair and it's not right. And just all we want is to be better and for people to listen, hear us and not blow us off. And there's lots of people that have mental health issues with Chiari malformation and that's not something that they should be blown off for. I cannot say enough positive things about our attorney, April Strang Kate. She went above and beyond for us. She believed us instantly. We told our story. She got the medical records. Um, she, you know, advised us through the entire process, even after, you know, she was there to help with the insurance companies and how to deal with everything. Um, and her cross examination was honestly one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And I felt like I got such closure from her cross examination and it was really pivotal to the case and super important. And I cannot thank her enough. She was wonderful to work with and I highly recommend her. Now we also are fortunate to have Dorothy Pope and we're bringing her on in Zoom again, but tell us who Dorothy is and what's her contribution to this whole issue in the case. She's the executive director of the Chiari Foundation so that she has great knowledge about what patients like Elizabeth have to fare with in their lives and how, quite frankly, they're often dismissed, disregarded because of the complexity of the disease and the fact that Physicians sometimes just don't spend the time and have the humility to understand and research and listen to the patient. These, these patients are um, people who trod a very difficult journey to get to their diagnosis and to get to the specialists in the country who can effectively treat them. Hi, I'm Dorothy Poppy, and I'm the Executive Director of the Bobby Jones Chiari and Syringomyelia Foundation. So the mission of the Bobby Jones Chiari and Syringomyelia Foundation is to advance knowledge through research and to educate the medical, allied sciences, and lay community about Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, and related disorders. So Bobby Jones CSF has funded over $6 million worth of education and research projects in its first 13 years and has impacted more than 3.5 million people around the globe who are looking for answers. Bobby Jones CSF is the only organization funding research, education, awareness, and advocacy for Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, and related disorders. And we have all of the following accreditations. The Better Business Bureau Wise Giving Alliance seal, the Guide Star Platinum Seal, the Health on the Net Han Code Certification, which is for accurate, scientific, current medical information. We were rated a 2020 top nonprofit independently by donors, patients, and families, and we recently received 100 out of 100 from the Charity Navigator Score, the only Chiari and Syringomyelia charity with 100% rating. So Elizabeth has been amazing and has hosted United Night Walks in Lancaster, Pennsylvania for several years to raise awareness and funds for research and advocacy. She really worked extensively with our chapter coordinator, Kathy Posnick, who does the walks for uh, patients all across the country. And we do them in about 30 cities a year. 
Um, Elizabeth has been a shining star in raising money, much needed money for the funds and projects we do. And April has been one of our huge sponsors for our Night of Light Gala, which last year was held in Washington, D.C. Um, her firm contributed money for the much needed research projects and helped us to raise even more awareness and support the projects that we are advocating for. So, so much thanks to April for all she does for our organization. You can contribute to the Bobby Jones, Chiari, and Syringa Myelia Foundation by going to bobbyjonescsf.org. Your gift means a lot to over 3 million people across the United States. What is the disease uh, sometimes often misdiagnosed as? Unfortunately, as in Elizabeth's case, it's often put down to psychological issues. In other words, hypochondria. Well, essentially a conversion disorder. Yeah. Uh, Steve, a conversion disorder is a, a mental illness where a patient is experiencing neurological symptoms, but there's no organic medical basis to explain those symptoms. And unfortunately, even though a Chiari malformation is quite organic, and you can see that on an imaging study, some doctors, like the doctor in Elizabeth's case, describe this malady as an incidental finding having no bearing to the symptoms. And suddenly it becomes the patient's fault, the patient who's psychologically distressed in some way. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting description, an incidental finding that has no bearing on her medical issues. How do they come up with that? In Elizabeth's particular case, once this Chiari malformation was diagnosed by the defendant, he thought so little of it that he told her the diagnosis in his office. He took a little yellow post-it sticky note, wrote Chiari on it, handed it to her, and said, if you're interested, Google it. Wow. So he kind of knew what the problem was, but he was unwilling to admit it, correct? He eventually knew, but he set in stone that diagnosis of conversion disorder, which yeah. then followed Elizabeth like a stigma until she finally got to the appropriate professionals. Let's talk about medical malpractice. A lot of people, um, when they go to a hospital, when something negative happens to one of their loved ones, a lot of times a doctor in a white coat will come out or the nurses will come out and say, we've got some bad news. He or she didn't make it. We tried our best. And maybe that's true, right? And there, I would guess that there are uh, a lot of cases that never go to court simply because um, they believe the doctor. Why would this doctor harm my loved one, right? Um, but as you well know, and as I well know, there are doctors out there that do harm people, a small percentage, but they do. And unfortunately, um, <clears throat> when that happens, how do you, what do you say to the people out there that may suspect that what the hospital and the doctor or the nurse is saying to them is not accurate? What do you tell them to do? My suggestion would be, first of all, to go to see a lawyer who has a reputation for conducting a competent investigation. Because unfortunately, as, as I'm sure you know, Tragedies happen that are not always at the fault of the medical profession. Mm -hmm. And so much of my work is actually sitting down with a prospective client after I've done an investigation. And I sometimes have to say to people who have devastating illness or injury, this was not the fault of the medical profession. And in that way, I really feel I'm serving a dual role. And one of those roles is to uphold the medical profession when there hasn't been an error. But when there has been, that's when I get involved or another lawyer like me to become that patient's champion, that gladiator, to carry the sword and to try to bring about justice really to all parties in the litigation. Yeah, now here's a question that, you know, I did a story in Kansas City of the doctor, Dr. Robert Tenney. I don't know whether you saw that show, but he was a doctor that killed 18 people in, his surgery, in the surgery and always blame somebody else. And um, prior to his 18th victim dying, who happened to be the mother of a lawyer, which was the wrong person to kill, actually, um, there used to be a national database where you could Google 
for lack of a better term, a doctor's name and find out what other lawsuits they've been involved with, who has accused them. Uh, now you can't do that. I think, and it was as a result of him and his lobbyists of changing this, I think there's a national database that hospitals have access to, but you have to have the doctor's license number and nobody has a doctor's, you know, the lay people, they don't have that. So my question to you is, um, how do you find out information about someone who's going to cut you open and you don't know anything about them? You can't go to Yelp, can you? No, no. <laughs> I mean, it is very difficult. And I, of course, being educated in this field and with my family, I'm very careful who we consult with because I, I know by reputation the physicians who, who are good at what they do. But for the ordinary person, it, it is difficult and there is not much more research beyond word of mouth. Um, the ordinary person is not going to read journal and literature that a physician has written. So it, it can be somewhat treacherous. Right. Do you think that medical malpractice lawsuits police the industry? I, I do. Those of us who are determined to only take cases with merit, I, I do think it serves that purpose. Do you think that... Um, that lobbyists for the American Medical Association, the insurance industry, try to distort uh, the fact that, you know, when problems happen, mistakes happen, uh, that it is not the doctor's fault, not the hospital's fault, but maybe your own fault. Most assuredly, yes. The blame comes back to the plaintiff or the patient so much of the time. But the reality is we're sitting here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania today, right? And that's where my predominant practices, I do have a nationwide practice, but a great deal of my practice is here. And regardless of the strength of the case, here at trial in Lancaster, the doctor wins more than 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. So that is a bit of a distortion by the insurance companies. Now, because of your reputation, because you practice nationally, um, you probably get a lot of inquiries to represent people. How do you select the cases that you end up representing? Exactly as we've been discussing. I go through a very rigorous investigation. I make sure that I consult with physicians who are of the highest caliber, who are unbiased, and who will give me not the opinion that the plaintiff's lawyer wants to hear, but the opinion of the truth and a doctor who is going to stand behind that in court if it gets to the trial level. And on, you know, the reality of it is 18 out of 20 people who come to me, I, I have to say no. Uh, but for those two out of 20, w we go forward and we know that there is a real meritorious case behind the story. You did a great job in this case, and I'm sure Elizabeth and her husband are very appreciative of that. And keep up the good work, and thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.